In 2006, Ruth Zuckerman took two of her spinning students out for lunch. Four months later, those three women opened the doors to the first Soul Cycle studio in Manhattan's Upper West Side. In the dreamy candlelit rooms of a Soul Cycle studio, the blasting music and dim lighting might be hiding more than sweaty cyclists hitting their training goals. With A-list celebrities and New York socialites alike swearing by the brand and spin instructors more akin to fitness messiahs, one has to wonder what draws people into a fitness studio Studio, drenched with every genre of controversy from racism, homophobia, and fat shaming to sexual assault allegations and political feuds. This is the story of how a spin instructor, a realtor, and a talent manager created the most exclusive workout club in America with just 33 rented bikes, an old dance studio, and lots of candles. In 1996, freshly divorced and looking for a job in the Big Apple, New York native Ruth Zuckerman began teaching spin classes at the Reebok Gym. As time went on, Ruth began to notice that clients who attended her spin class at the gym only attended her spin class. They didn't use any of the other facilities or classes offered. They signed up for her classes, they attended her classes, then they went home. This gave Ruth an idea. In 2006, after a decade of working as a spin instructor at different gyms, Ruth invited two of her spin clients for lunch at Soho House. The two women, real estate agent Elizabeth Cutler and talent manager Julie Rice, hit it off immediately. And once the three of them got to talking about their passions and aspirations, the idea of Soul Cycle was born. Ruth, who had spent years watching clients choose spin over any other exercise, believed in the possibility of a fitness studio dedicated to spin classes. Elizabeth and Julie were immediately on board, sharing the fitness boutique concept which had cropped up across the country on the sunny west coast. At these specialty fitness boutiques, clients exercised, socialized, and formed a whole community based around their shared workouts. Four months after their first ever meeting, the three women christened an old dance studio on the Upper West Side 72nd Street as the very first Soul Cycle Studio. They rented 33 stations bikes which they would arrange in neat rows and build a front desk space entirely out of IKEA furniture and decorations. Flyers for the studio, printed and posted across the city by the three women coupled with a sandwich board and yellow rickshaw bearing their logo propped outside their building, were the only promotion SoulCycle received in its early days. A far cry from the sleek SoulCycle studios of today whose halls are sprinkled with motivational quotes and facilities boast upwards of 50 bikes each. The humble Manhattan studio had one thing going for it exclusivity. With the minimal promotion that Ruth, Elizabeth, and Julie were able to generate by themselves, SoulCycle began growing primarily through word of mouth. In the tight-knit circles of the city's wealthy, trendy, and fitness savvy, word trickled down about a private, spin-only fitness boutique tucked away from the public. In this way, the lack of street visibility became an advantage for SoulCycle, adding to its allure. The studio continued to grow through its exclusive Whisper network, and by the time their five-year lease was up, they had blown past their predictions of 75 daily clients, hosting upwards of 300 clients each day for spin classes in their little studio. By 2007, SoulCycle opened the doors to the barn, their second studio located in the Hamptons, the summer spot of choice for affluent New Yorkers in the summer. French socialite Charlotte Sarkozy was quoted lauding SoulCycle during their first summer in the Hamptons, saying, Oh my god, there's this super hot lesbian teaching this amazing workout. All the mothers are in love with her. The workout is so good. With Charlotte came a clique of five affluent women, whose own friends then wanted to attend, and so the chain reaction of SoulCycle continued. By the end of summer, the newfound SoulCycle enthusiasts carried their habit with them into the city, lining up outside the studio in the Upper West Side for 9.30 a.m. classes every day. SoulCycle was as successful and exclusive as ever when co-founder Ruth Zuckerman stepped away from the company in 2009. She stated that SoulCycle had become the club you can't get into. And though that was appealing to a great number of people, it went against her beliefs. Shortly after, Ruth launched what would become one of SoulCycle's biggest competitors, Flywheel. With the goal of welcoming anyone and everyone, not just the elite upper echelons of society, and to focus more on the workout itself instead of who was conducting the workout classes.
Much like Charlotte Sarkozy, other SoulCycle regulars didn't just take spin classes. No, they took Griffith, or Stacy, or Lori, or Rike, or any of the number of other instructors who had become the main draw of their studios. Each instructor had their own style, their own music, their own backstory, and most importantly, their own clientele. SoulCycle pioneered the idea of a fitness instructor being more important than the workout itself, and their instructors became the lifeblood of the company. To this day, SoulCycle remains extremely selective about who gets to become an instructor. The long process starts with a buy or try annual nationwide audition. From the thousands of applicants, only 120 hopefuls are actually selected to go through the audition process, from which roughly 25 make it to the eight-week training program in SoulCycle's New York City headquarters. Trainees eat, sleep, and breathe SoulCycle for those weeks, and by the end of it, come out ready to instruct and motivate a legion of loyal riders across the country. In return, SoulCycle takes amazing care of their instructors. From health insurance and paid vacation time to on-site physical therapists and clothing allowances, instructors are compensated well for their dedication to the SoulCycle way of life. For a time, SoulCycle drew in anyone who was anyone to its booming candlelit studios. From David Beckham and Beyonce to the former First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, each had their preferred instructor and each instructor had their own list of riders. SoulCycle operates on a unique booking system where classes can only be booked the week of, and once the bikes are gone, they are gone. With class spots selling out within minutes of each week and an A-list clientele to manage, instructors started keeping their own special wait list for their favorite riders. Riders who would lavish their instructors with attention, gifts, and vacations just to catch their attention. Shady waitlisting was the least of SoulCycle's worries when it came to instructors. However, as the structure of the brand itself began to impose on the day-to-day -day of the spin studios. From the pricey $34 per class to the near-instant fill of sessions, every layer of SoulCycle built it up as a club only the elite get into. Instructors became the leaders of that club. They called the shots, they pulled the strings, and they were the faces of the company. This gave instructors who were catapulted into influencer or even celebrity status a power over the riders, riders who wouldn't question anything they said in hopes of catching their attention. This was further perpetuated by the internal culture of SoulCycle, where senior staff encouraged instructors to make riders want to be them or be with them, and held the sex appeal of instructors above much else. Instructors began taking advantage of their unique position in the business, structuring their sessions to have their favorite riders up front, and exiling novices or even people they just didn't like looking at to the back of the room. Then came the verbal abuse of less ideal riders, from fat shaming and homophobia to racial slurs being hurled at clients in class. Instructors ruled their sessions with an iron fist, and oftentimes nothing was done about it. Their adoring regular riders wouldn't dare report them, and the unfortunate victims of their abuse were shamed into keeping silent. Allegations even surfaced against popular instructor Mike Press, who was accused of pressuring a rider to perform a sexual act on him. The writer then said she alerted SoulCycle and was ignored. SoulCycle would go on to face more controversy with time from parent company Equinox owner Stephen Ross hosting a fundraiser for President Trump, to SoulCycle's silence during the breakout of the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer of 2020. Both of these instances went against the inclusive and diversity-friendly image that the brand portrayed in ad campaigns as the company expanded with many previous supporters labeling them as elitist hypocrites. Their expansion did eventually work against them, however, when the brand was no longer able to maintain their exclusive and elite image by trying to reach a wider audience, as writers both A-list and regular dropped off the workout regime and many instructors distanced themselves following controversies, SoulCycle began its slow descent into normalcy. SoulCycle was a revolutionary fitness brand that pioneered the East Coast obsession with luxury fitness studios and withstood the financial crisis of 2008. Today, behind sleek welcome desks and expansive spin facilities, gone is the hyper-exclusive workout cult everyone wanted to get into, leaving behind a spin studio riddled with contention, controversy, and lots of candles.